Today, in this BRLSI Spotlight, I'm going to be talking to Professor Ed File, who's Professor of Microbial Evolution at the University of Bath. Ed is my colleague in the Department of Biology and Biochemistry at Bath, but today I'm going to be talking to him via an internet link because of social distancing due to the SARS-CoV-2 virus that causes the pandemic COVID-19 disease. And uh, uh, I'm going to be asking him some questions about how the pandemic coronavirus can be controlled. In previous uh, conversations that we've had, we talked about the SARS-CoV-2 virus that causes COVID-19 disease uh, and um, how it's spread through the human population. And uh, now I'd like to pick your brains a bit on um, what's being done to slow up or even eliminate the spread of the virus. So um, traditionally, uh, epidemics have been tackled by prompt diagnosis and tracing personal contacts. Uh, in other words, very like what's done for people suffering from sexually transmitted infections or STIs. Um, has that been successful for coronavirus? It was certainly a central uh, pillar of the uh, the initial um, strategy in in China in Wuhan, um, where they had uh, uh, they shut. Well, it was in combination with a number of uh, other restrictions on 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 travel, etc. Um, but what they were able to do in in Wuhan, in particular, in that city where the outbreak started, was um, to d deploy an enormous number of of healthcare workers to do what's called contact tracing. So when when individuals were identified who were infected, um, uh, these workers could then uh, go out and, and identify uh, as many of the people who had previously had contact with those infected people as possible, test those people um, and if necessary isolate those contacts and then go on and uh, uh, trace track down the contacts of those people as well and so on and so on. So this is kind of um, old old-fashioned uh, traditional epidemiology on the ground uh, as you like. Um, and I don't know if you've you've seen the film Contagion, um, which has been trending on Netflix and uh, has been on been on uh, normal TV a few times recently, and and it brings it home actually. It, it's quite it's quite a good movie. Um, that that what really brings it home is the speed with which these this sort of contact tracing needs to happen to really um, you know put out the fire as quickly as possible. Um, and really, that did help a lot in in uh, China and also in in uh, South Korea. But it, you can't do the contact tracing unless you can uh, uh, you have also the capacity to uh, test whether those individuals are infected or not. Of course, so those two um, go together uh, very well. But yeah, you're absolutely right. I mean, the the case of STIs, um, gonorrhea, and chlamydia. Um, a very very efficient way of of uh, cutting off uh, transmission routes is simply to ask people who have been infected to to notify their previous partners to let them know um, that there's a chance that they've also been infected and that they should uh, seek advice and seek testing. Um, that's a really really very efficient uh, economical way of of controlling those sort of diseases and the same principle as you say applies um, to this uh, virus as well. Yeah so uh, but people have been talking about using um, mobile phone apps to uh, do this contact tracing. Um, are we going to be doing that here do you think? Um, well actually I hope so. I mean this this again was used in, in China um, it's simplistic to say, well, let's just do everything that that China did. Um, you know, in, in one in one sense, that that's kind of uh, the right way to look at about it. But it's not a very realistic way to look about it because we're we're a liberal democracy and we can't force people to 
to carry these essentially tracking devices around with us the whole time. It doesn't sit very comfortably with us, but um, but actually we all do already, don't we? Well, we do because... already. Yeah, 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 yeah. Well, that that's true. Yeah, <laughs> well, that's a good point. Um, um, but yeah, so so in in China there was uh, there's a there's a uh, everybody was they weren't actually forced to um, to carry uh, a phone and an app around with them. But the way it worked was that everybody had a, uh, a, a who had a phone, which is basically everybody had a government installed app on the phone, which would uh, uh, use a sort of traffic light system for their own uh, personal health status, either um green or uh, amber or uh red and if they wanted to go into certain parts of the city or catch trains or buses then they had to show that they were an appropriate health status um so that's that's one way of you know it's it's, it's debatable how effective that kind of system was but and we're not planning anything quite like that here but what we are uh, uh what there are plans to try and uh, implement is a, is an app which um enables so-called proximity sensing so it uses bluetooth um to record so the phone will record the code of every other phone um that it comes into reasonably close contact with um and that's all uploaded to the cloud somewhere um and though when there's a when the, uh, there's a point in time when one person gets infected um they will then enter that uh, their health status into the phone and automatically the 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 algorithms will work out which other people that person has been in contact with say in the previous two weeks and they will receive an automatic notification um to go and get themselves tested um or at least seek advice um, so this, you know, as I say, it doesn't necessarily sit very comfortably with, with us in the fact that, that, that our movements are being tracked and who we've been in contact with is, is kind of uh, uh, being recorded to some extent, even though it should all be anonymized in a way that there's just the phone codes are actually being used. Um, but nevertheless, um, if enough people do it, say if half the population buy into this scheme, um, then I think it could really, really help with the next phase of our our, um, our strategy when we we begin to slowly, slowly lift some of the restrictions that we're living under at the moment. Um, uh, because I say uh, speed is actually of, of, of complete paramount importance when when it yeah. comes to to you know identifying and and suppressing little bursts of flames all transmission routes as and when they they break out as quickly as possible yeah well we, we'll talk about the exit strategy again a, a bit later on um but i guess the thinking about um tracking devices i suppose the key to this is persuading people that there's something in it for them yeah that's absolutely right and i think that that um that's that 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 message um has largely got through that um this isn't the, the what we're being asked to do in terms of our uh, uh behavior stay at home and um isn't just about protecting us it's about protecting everybody um and it'll be interesting to see how this uh sort of more sort of population level thinking kind of feeds in over the longer term maybe we can discuss this in the in the next interview but it may be that um, there's a slight shift in in our priorities away from sort of individual rights, uh, which has been the, the sort of cornerstone of medical ethics in particular over the last sort of 50, 60 years, um, back towards a more kind of uh, a community population centric perspective um, where, you know, the, the good of the many outweigh, the, the needs of the many outweigh the needs of the few, to, to quote um, Mr. Spock. Um, yeah. um, so, it, it, you know, it may it may sort of be happening to a degree already um, that we're 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 taking this more sort of community oriented view about uh, 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 that determines our actions, which, of course, comes more naturally to countries like um, China anyway. Um, well, let, let's see. We'll, yeah, as I say, we'll talk about this again. <laughs> yeah. 
So uh, in, in many places such as the UK, um, non-targeted measures like generally applied social distancing have rather quickly replaced uh, individually targeted responses. And uh, I wonder if you might like to talk a bit about what, why that has had to be and uh, whether social distancing is indeed effective. Um, so uh, to answer the first question, why was that? I think it was just a realisation um, that we needed much more dramatic interventions um, uh, quickly in order to prevent a catastrophic collapse of the healthcare system. I mean, it, it's as simple as that. It's the Imperial College report on the on the uh, 16th of March, I believe, that that made that point um, very clear. Um, the the strategy of sort of individual testing um, was employed uh, in South Korea. Um, with great effect and they didn't have all the social distancing um, but the difference there was that they had a, a massive uh, capacity they had a very aggressive uh, testing uh, approach um, and they were able to to uh, identify cases very very quickly and, and nip the thing in the bud without all the social uh, distancing that we've had to do we, we just simply uh, didn't have the capacity to do that on the scale that they did in South Korea. So the the only option was to do undergo the sort of social distancing, which has been the case in, in the vast majority of countries. Um, and as I say, that that was absolutely necessary, um, at least in, in the in the relatively short term, to just buy us time um, and to prevent the healthcare system from completing completely overwhelmed. Because you have to, of course, bear in mind that it's not just about um, uh, all the people that would die of COVID. It's all the the ripples, all the the so-called collateral damage, to use a terrible phrase. That what if the healthcare systems are completely overwhelmed? And you know, if you have a heart attack, then you could be waiting an hour for an ambulance rather than five minutes because all the ambulances are taken up with COVID cases. And when you get there, there'll be no nobody to treat you anyway. So you're going to die. <laughs> um, so so you know that that's that's what we were up against and it looks yes. such wood as if we've managed to avoid that complete nightmarish scenario and as I say bought ourselves a bit of time to build up um, some capacity build up some expertise to brace ourselves for the next phase in our fight against this infection and, and, uh, it, uh, and to does it actually question, work yeah 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 <laughs> and to answer your second question it does actually absolutely work um if you stop, we know how this transmits. We know how this virus transmits it a droplet infection and on surfaces. And if you stop those uh, opportunities for infection, then you will slow down the spread of the virus. I mean, we're on tender hooks at the moment, wait, wait desperately looking at the, the numbers every day to look for signs that we've turned the corner. Um, there may be some signs there, maybe not. It's, it's, it's very difficult to say, but there are certainly signs in 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 Italy and Spain that uh, that the the numbers of deaths and cases have started to fall, and we're implementing essentially the same measures as as those places. There are differences in details, but um, uh, they are details. So you know they, these measures do work. We will uh, uh, begin to see a drop off in cases and deaths um, shortly. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. So um, politicians uh, and uh, other policy makers uh, talk about this social distancing policy as flattening the curve. Uh, yeah. Could you just unpack that for us a bit? I mean, what does that actually mean when we say flattening the curve? So it really means um, uh, avoiding um, uh, a, a surge of infections and cases and, and uh, critically ill people um, that we simply wouldn't have the, the capacity to deal with. Yeah. So, it so it's actually all about timing r it, rather than necessarily reducing the total number of people. That, affected. That's right. It's absolutely all about timing. So it may be that in the end we have the same number of, of, of infections um, as we would anyway. 
um, uh, but just spread out over a longer period. Um, and of course, the longer we can spread it out, it may mean that we have, uh, it should mean that we have fewer deaths because we don't, we, we're able to to uh, treat those those uh, patients with it uh, more efficiently. We also buy ourselves time in that we should um, hopefully get some sort of therapeutic advances in drugs or yeah. eventually a vaccine, of course. So, so yeah. yes, it is absolutely all about buying ourselves time. Yeah, yeah. Those are two very good points that you just made there, Ed. Um, and uh, I sometimes think that, um, you know, our policy makers don't get it over well enough to us that actually uh, it is advantageous to everybody to slow, uh, to, to flatten the curve, because those people who would get ill uh, have a much better chance if uh, there aren't too many people all ill at once. Yeah. That's, that's so, um, so, so that's what we're doing um, to slow the spread of the virus. In, in one of our interviews, we talked about the, the reproductive number of the virus, the R0 value, so-called. Uh, and, and what we're really doing uh, in this flattening the curve approach is uh, to um, basically reduce the effective reproductive number, make the virus a little bit less if uh, successful of being transmitted. But once the virus uh, gets to us, um, you know, our immune systems uh, have some say in whether the virus actually causes a disease or not. So will people become immune to SARS-CoV-2? Um, well, that's certainly the hope um, and certainly the expectation. Um, there will uh, uh, there will surely, I mean, it's, it's very, very likely that there, there'll be immunity over the, the, the short term. But the real question is how long that immunity will last. Um, and, you know, basically, we don't really know. Um, uh, the best uh, thing we can do at the moment is to look at uh, other uh, members of the same uh, virus family, the beta coronaviruses. Um, and there's a slightly mixed picture. So if, if you look at some of the, the, um, the more benign viruses that uh, uh, occasionally give us common cold, then um, apparently the, the immune response to those viruses doesn't last much longer than a year, which would be quite bad news. Um, if we look at SARS, uh, there may be a slightly stronger immune response, which lasts a little bit longer. But we simply don't know um, what how long the immune response to this virus will be. And it's worth bearing in mind that there are no vaccines for any of these viruses. Um, there's no vaccine for the common cold. Um, there are no really good therapeutic drugs for the common cold. There's no cure, as you, as everyone knows, for the common cold. Yeah. Um, so, so we're really uh, um, uh, starting from scratch to a degree with building a a, a vaccine, uh, developing and and distributing a vaccine for this particular virus, which is quite a contrast from influenza, of course, where we're we've got a lot more experience um, with vaccine development. Um, there may be a seasonable, seasonal effect with this virus. Um, uh, so it may sort of naturally uh, uh, disappear a little bit over the summer anyway, which of course would buy us a little bit more time in the next phase. But in terms of the, uh, in terms of the immunology, we're still a little bit in the dark. Um, and it may be that, you know, we're seeing sort of intermittent um, social distancing uh, uh, um, and other kind of uh, uh, strategies along those lines for uh, maybe into uh, uh, 2022 even. There's a paper um, just out a couple of days ago in Science that raised that possibility, um, which will be, you know, kind of coincide with when we expect to have a vaccine not only developed, but <laughs> producing a sufficient quantity that we can all get some of it, which is going to be the second part of that vaccine challenge. Yeah, yeah. And I guess, uh, too, um, our understanding of all of this 
situation is going to have to depend on medical researchers uh, being able to study the serology of uh, people who've had the disease, uh, looking at, at whether they actually have good antibodies against uh, the virus and uh, how long they persist and, and so on. Um, and uh, I suppose it's a, a problem that uh, essentially all of our doctors are so busy treating the disease, yeah. uh, they're going to find it quite hard to get um, time to do this. Anyway, um, so th this leads us uh, into um, a, a rather tricky question, which is, um, can natural immunity actually be used as a control strategy? Do you think that we can really rely on people becoming immune to the disease uh, once they've had it? And does that render uh, the, the, the population as a whole largely immune? Would, would that help? So uh, another benefit of, in a sense, stringing this out as long as we can is that we will build, start to build up natural immunity in the population anyway and of course that's only going to help um, but that's a slightly different question from using uh, immunity as a strategy which i think uh, is is a, a slightly reckless idea um, uh, because we don't know how long immunity will last um, because if we uh, try and you know take our turn the turn the dimmer switch too far and allow too many people to get infected then we always run the risk of going over that critical point of where we uh, 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 run out of critical care capability um and of course it how uh, it will it would feel very very silly if we can't if we if we pursue this sort of strategy only to develop in in a in a year's time or so uh uh, decent drugs and a decent vaccine, um, having uh, essentially allowed a certain proportion of the of the country to get infected and probably die. Um, <laughs> if therapies then come along later anyway, then then it, it you know it, it's it it would it would seem slightly ridiculous that we've the, that we've actually allowed that to happen. Um, so I think it's going to uh, happen anyway. And of course, the more immunity there is, the better. Um, but I think as a as an overarching strategy for uh, uh, controlling the outbreak, I think that, that it's it's a it's a slightly reckless gamble. Yes, I think the best that one could say about it really is that it would at the very least be a very costly yeah. strategy uh, yeah. in terms of of life yeah. um, and suffering. Yeah. Well, um, so. Um, Many people, including the politicians, now are starting to talk about um, what kind of exit strategy is uh, available to us. And it, it's pretty obvious that people are talking about this, at least in part, because they're a bit fed up with being cooped up at home. Sure, um, sure. But, but what about the science? Um, I mean, it, does the science of epidemiology have anything very useful to say about the best formulation for an exit strategy? So I think the first thing to uh, bear in mind about the exit strategy is that the it, it is a, a combination of epidemiology and economics. Um, there's a there's a calculation, a balance to be struck between uh, um, uh, keeping a lid on on the outbreak and keeping below this this critical threshold of, of uh, uh, um, critical care capacity and not allowing the economy and people's livelihoods to completely tank so um, in terms of the you know the, the cold sort of epidemiological numbers that I think the way to look at it is let's um, at the moment we're basically more or less trying to get this r naught number down as low as we can certainly well below one uh which is the level at which um uh below that below one the 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 the, the spread is self-limiting right um so 
at the moment we're trying to get it down to maybe 0 0.4 0 0.5 something like that and china there's estimates in, in wuhan they got it down to 0 0.3 um you know through their even more draconian uh, measures um and then once we're at some point <laughs> when we when we sort of can calculate that there's the number of cases in the community is low enough we can start to restrict certain measures like open schools, open some businesses. Uh, some people can start going back to work um, and slowly take the, the, the relax the measures, but try and keep that R naught below one. Um, so that's that's the sort of epidemiological approach. Um, so just try and keep a lid on it. And of course, this 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 phase will be absolutely dependent on our testing capacity and the contact tracing and all the things that we we kind of started off doing um, and was done in South Korea um, but then we realized we couldn't do them here because we didn't have the capacity you know our best hope is now that when we get to that phase in maybe a month six weeks time we have the testing capacity to 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 test a much wider uh, uh, sways of the population not just the hospitalized patients um, yeah. So that we will be able to actually uh, identify new transmission chains as and when they emerge uh, uh, um, and then do the contract tracing, possibly using this app as we've already discussed. Um, and that's, you know, so there's no single magic bullet. It's going to be all about the details, all about getting as much information as we possibly can about where the where the virus is um uh, uh um and and how the relaxation of measures is having an effect on the number of cases and the number of hospitalizations and it may be it's likely that there'll be different effects in different parts of the country so we may see uh, more sort of regional implementation measures rather than locking down the whole country there may be uh, uh, targeted measures in particular cities for example if that if it if it needs if it looks like there's there's this danger of it going out of control again in a particular region so that's how i see it working and essentially um you have to you have to imagine a great list of different possible intervention measures that can happen different businesses that can open you know different restrictions on movement and then weigh up those against uh, uh, what the economic implications of each of those will be and what the implications in terms of the managing the outbreak will be and just pick the best cost benefit uh, yeah. um, uh, scenario that you can and slowly move up and down that scale as and when you need to by keeping as close an eye on what's going on with the virus as you can with all the with all the testing etc yes it, it's uh, it's going to be uh, very demanding both on the supply of uh, people to do the necessary personal contacting sure. uh, luckily there are lots of people who seem to want to volunteer to do that yeah yeah, yeah. Uh, but i guess it will also be very demanding on the provision of adequate testing facilities and i guess that's uh, a place where we scientists can um, try and uh, pitch in. Absolutely, absolutely. And it's not like we don't have the capacity in this country to do that. It's just that we we haven't been quite as bureaucratically nimble as other countries like Germany, which are, which are more decentralised and have been able to utilise their capacity a, a, a lot, lot more quickly than we have here. Yes, yes. And I guess the fact that um, a large part of the world's uh, diagnostic industry is located in German-speaking countries. Uh, probably helped quite a lot. Yeah, sure, sure. Yeah, yeah. That's right. So um, some people, uh, notably President Trump, have said things like, "One day it's like a miracle; it will disappear." Yeah. Is that a realistic prospect? I um I don't think we can take anything that comes out of <laughs> President Trump's mouth as, as anything remotely realistic. <laughs> um uh no, there'll be no miracle. Uh people talk about SARS um like like it just fizzled out, but there was no miracle with SARS. It it 
it, it disappeared through these very aggressive contact tracing and quarantine procedures that we've talked about. Exactly the same. It was a lot easier with SARS in a sense because there wasn't this stealthy uh, uh, transmission without symptoms. So you you either you got SARS and you knew you got SARS and people could identify cases, you know, quite easily because they were very very ill. Um, uh, yeah. There was no transmission without the symptoms. So that was the basic difference with SARS. Um, but it wasn't a miracle. It was through it was through massive amount, massive amount of effort um, uh, uh, and, you know, mobilization of an enormous uh, amount of resources and, and manpower, um, which is, you know, what we what we're going to need now and then a lot more, you know. <laughs> um, so, no, there's no miracle. It's going to be uh, a, a, a massive drain on 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 resources. Um, it's going to be a massive scientific collective global effort um and uh you know the withdrawal of us funds from who this morning oh, that's, uh, that's just you really just true. you just want to hold your head in your hands and you know now of all times to um and it's it's really really uh so uh, makes you so frustrated and angry um um, so no, it's going to take a, a all hands to the pump. Um, that's the only yeah. way we're we're, go we're going to get through this, really. Yeah, I suppose uh, uh, a more positive way of looking at it is that uh, it's often been observed that people work together best when their backs are against the wall. Yeah. So uh, some collective responsibility and a collective response will be good news. Absolutely, and and and, uh, and uh, an example of that is is the uh, so my particular uh, field of research is really on the genomics. Um, so understand using the the DNA or RNA sequence data to to try and figure out how it's spreading around and mutating. And um, there has been a genuinely brilliant and inspiring global collaboration in sharing data very very quickly. Uh, producing uh, uh, platforms for visualization and analysis, um, which has been uh, uh, genuinely really, really useful. Um, and that's just one example that I know about of how the, the, we can all work together as a, as a global community. And indeed, I don't think it's generally known uh, outside the scientific community that uh, all the literature being published on this is being fast tracked and made available free to everyone absolutely yeah, uh, yeah, yeah. which is a, a magnificent response it really is, yeah yeah no that's a good point well ed thanks very much I, I think you've done really a lot today to answer lots of people's basic questions about how this pandemic coronavirus is currently being tackled and uh, next time uh, when we meet again um, we'll try and talk about how the pandemic might alter the basic fabric of our life. <laughs> yes. Um, yes. So thanks a lot and uh, I'll see you next time. Thank you, Stuart. Well. Yeah, you too. Bye bye. Thanks very much to Ed File for talking to me today about the pandemic coronavirus that is causing such havoc all over the world. Um, I hope that you watching this uh, have enjoyed this BRLSI spotlight and uh, that it leaves you better informed about uh, the current pandemic crisis. But before I sign off, I'd just like to remind everyone watching this of some really important things that we all have to do to reduce the spread of the virus. So. Uh, Social distancing is important, so please um, stay inside unless you need to be out. And uh, of course, some exercise is okay, but uh, go out and keep your distance from other people. Avoid touching your face. Wash your hands frequently. Catch coughs and sneezes. And of course, seek medical advice if you develop a persistent cough and fever. Meanwhile, Stay safe, stay well, goodbye.